Hi, welcome to part three on our subunit related to Egyptian art. Um, in this segment, we're going to be looking at art from the Old Kingdom. The earliest dynastic period began around 3100 BC when Upper and Lower Egypt were unified, as we saw with the palette of Narmer. Um, the Old Kingdom dates from the start of the third of these dynasties in about 2686 BC. It ended about 500 years later. The end came when a, strong, when a strong centralized government established by the pharaohs was weakened by the rise of a group of independent nobles. These nobles split the country into small states. Soon civil war and disorder broke out between these states and the authority of the reigning pharaoh collapsed. After a long period of turmoil, the nobles in Thebes, a city on the upper Nile, were able to gain control of the country. They managed to unify Egypt once again into a single state um, and order was, was restored in their troubled land. The success of these nobles marks the beginning of what would be the Middle Kingdom, um, and that lasted approximately 250 years, but we're not going to really look at the old Middle Kingdom. All right, so Egyptian art. Let's review some, um, some stylistic conventions. I think you're, hopefully we've established these and you're familiar with them. So Egyptian art is marked by conservative, a, a, a form of conservatism. So rules, conventions established in the earliest periods persisted for almost the entire um, span of, of the Egyptian empire, so about 3,000 years. And there was very little flux, fluctuation with the exception of the Armenar period under Akhenaten, which we'll look at later. So again, some characteristics and conventions, the use of registers, horizontal bands um, with the bottom line serving as a ground line for figures, um, to the combination of text and images. So we often see hieroglyphics in images. Um, number three, on flat surfaces, things may be seen from the front, the side, or above. So they often incorporated multiple viewpoints. Um, and this also included the composite view of figures where um, you would have um, the head in profile, the eye frontal, the torso frontal, and the rest of the body in profile. Number four, sculptural works um, carved from blocks of hard stone are usually blockish with a, dominance, with a dominance of vertical and horizontal lines. So that's something we're going to look at in this chapter or in this segment when we start to look at Old, old Kingdom um, statues. And again, this use of the material um, and this idea of using this kind of vertical, vertical and horizontal lines really communicates this idea of permanence and stability. Number five, people of high rank are portrayed with strict conventions, but everyone else is portrayed naturalistically. And we started to touch on that a little bit when we were looking at the palette of Narmer. Um, to narrow it down even more, conventions for, for depicting the pharaoh or the pharaoh's family were very consistent. Um, usually they were stylized and very much idealized. And the idea was that this was intended so that they looked divine. Um, often rulers were portrayed in the prime of their life. They usually are depicted with this idealized body, broad shoulders, narrow hips, kind of like a swimmer um, or a swimmer or an athlete like that. Um, there might be some slight muscular definition, but not too much because they didn't want um, they didn't want to look they didn't want them to look like laborers. So if you think about it, a laborer would have very um, defined muscular. Um, muscularity. Um, a calm facial expression, we'll notice. Um, individualized portraits appear only in facial features, so there might be some variances in the facial features to suggest some sort of identity. Higher arctic perspective and scale. Again, on a flat surface, composite view, you know, face, hips, legs, and feet, um, and and profile, um, the torso frontal, and the eye um, is also frontal. In sculpture, usually the, um, the sculptures are facing strictly frontal. Um, poses, they're either sitting with both feet on the ground, standing with one foot a few inches forward, or striding forwards. So this is one of the first um, Old Kingdom statues that we're going to be looking at. Um, this isn't on your 250 works, but it's a it's a good one to look at and compare to the one that is going to be 
in your list. And so this is a statue of Khafre. Um, he was a ruler. Um, it was found in the Giza, the Valley Temple of Khafre. Um, and we'll, we'll again look at um, pyramids. So a lot of these Old Kingdom statues were found um, in pyramids. The three-dimensional representations, while being quite formal, also aim to reproduce the real world. Um, statuary of gods, royalty, and elite were designed to convey an idealized version of that individual. Some aspects of naturalism were dictated by the material. Stone statuary, for example, was quite closed, with arms held close to the sides, limited positions, uh, a strong back pillar that provided support, and with the fill spaces left between limbs. So a lot of what they mean by that is there wasn't a lot of um, removal of the stone sort of in between limbs. So it really maintains a sort of block of stone that it was carved from. Life-size sculptures found in Coffrey's burial chamber. Um, and you can see this is one here. And we see the falcon god Horus perched on the back of his throne. And you can see it right here. Here's a better, a better view. So remember, this is a stylistic convention. We saw it with the palette of, of Narmer. Remember, we saw the, the bird-headed god um, um, represented. And so that's sort of a convention that we see in Egyptian art. Wings of the bird form a protective gesture that embrace around that sort of form this embrace around the king's head. And again, this is the king's paw uh, or spirit as well. Um, the symbol, well, the statue is is serving as a, a to to hold the ka, the king's spirit. I'm sorry. And and the the falcon is is the the deity, um, the bird-headed god. We also see a symbol of a lion, um, and this represents um, authority. And let me see if I can find him. Here, I think here. Let me see if I can zoom in. So it looks like the paws of a lion, but I think it's somewhere like a, re a relief sculpture. So again, lions were an important symbol of regal authority. At the base of the throne, we see an intertwined um, lotus and papyrus plant um, representing the king's power over upper, um, which over upper Egypt, which was the lotus, is represented by the lotus, and lower Egypt, was, which was represented by the papyrus plant. So again, we see a lot of the same iconography that we saw in the palette of Narmer. Um, he wears traditional royal attire, so a short pleated kilt. Um, he has a linen headdress um, and then a false beard. Um, and, then, and again, this was a symbol of royalty. And so when we look at these statues, they really exude a strong sense of dignity, calmness, and permanence. You know, the hard stone, which is um, Dorite, um, which was extremely hard and very um, was considered a precious resource um, helps with this um, notion. We can see the idealized body type. He's muscular but slim, um, and the work is a bit stiff and very much stylized. Um, and this is the format of presentation of royalty, and it will not change throughout the long history of ancient Egypt, except for a very brief period towards um, the late kingdom. So we're going to look at an excavation site, and we're going to look at some more old statue, old kingdom statuary. On January 10th, 1910, excavators under the direction of George Reisner, head of the joint Harvard University Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, um, uh, did an expedition to Egypt, and they uncovered an astonishing collection of statuary in the Valley Temple connected to the Pyramid of Menkora, or, and that's um, Khafre's son. Menkor's pyramid had been explored in the 1830s using dynamite <laughs> um, to excavate. Um, his carved granite sarcophagus was removed and sub subsequently lost at sea. So that was a, a great loss and a shame. And while the pyramid temple at the base was in only media mediocre condition, the valley temple was, was happily ignored um, by looters and so therefore somewhat intact. 
Reisner had been excavating on the Giza Plateau for several years at this point. His team had already explored the elite cemetery to the west of the Great Pyramid of Khufu before turning their attention to Menkora's um, complex, um, most particularly the barely touched Valley Temple. In the southwest, southwest corner of the structure, the team discovered magnif a magnificent cache, cache of statuary carved in smooth granite dark stone called Garywak or Greywick um, or Scheist. Um, these are a number, and there were a number of triad statues, and triad means um, three, the number three. So you can see three figures depicted here, and you can see here um, how it looked during the excavation. Um, each showing three figures, the king, um, the fundamentally important goddess Hathor, and the personification of Nome, a geographic destination similar to the modern idea of a religion a region, district, or county. And so you can see this triad represented here. So a lot of these were found, and you can see that it has some of the similar characteristics of the Khafre statue. Um, so again, the idealized body, um, this very rigid and um, you know blocky presentation. Um, they're faced frontally. Um, you know their arms are you know, very close to their sides. They're somewhat striding forward, the false beard. Um, so many of the accoutrements in the, in the, this headdress is a little bit different, but you can see he's wearing a crown. It looks like a bowling ball pin. And hopefully you remember what, um, if that represents upper or lower Egypt. See if you can remember. I'm not going to tell you. Dyads, Reisner's team also revealed the extraordinary um, dyad. So dyad is two, so two figures, and this is the statue of Menkari and a queen, and it's it's quite different um, than the triads. It was you know unusual because it was um, just the two um, figures, and so this is the one that is important for you to, to know for the 250 work for the College Board AP Art History List. The two figures um, stand side by side on a simple square base and are supported by a, a shard um, back pillar. So very much like um, the statue of um, Khafre that we looked at. Um, they both face to the front, although Menkora's head is noticeably turned to the right just a little bit. Um, this image was likely originally positioned within an architectural niche, making it appear as though they were emerging from the structure, so that's kind of interesting. The broad shoulder, youthful body of the king is covered only with a traditional short pleated kilt known as a, a, a shinjet, S-H-E-N-D-G, sorry, J-E-T. And his head um, sports the primary um, sort of headdress um, or linen headdress that we often see and an artificial royal beard or a false beard. Um, in his clenched hands, um, which are held straight down at his sides, he grasps um, ritual cloth rolls. There, and so that's what he's holding. His body is straight, strong. Again, this idea of eternally youthful with no signs of age. So again, very much idealized. Here's some details. Um, his facial features are remarkably individualized with prominent eyes, a fleshy nose, um, and a full mouth with, protruding, with a sort of protruding lower lip. So there is some slight variation in the facial features to show um, specific, you know, the identity of a, of a ruler. So Minkara's queen provides a perfect female counterpart to his youthful masculine virility. And so that was kind of the concept too, to, to communicate this idea of power and virility and masculinity. Um, sensually modeled with a beautiful proportioned body emphasized by a clinging garment that's kind of see-through. Um, she articulates ideal mature feminine beauty. This is a sense of the individual. There is a sense of the individual um, in her face as well. Neither Menkora nor his queen are depicted in the purely idealized manner that was the norm for royal images. Instead, through the overlay of royal formality, we see the depiction of a living person filling the role of Pharaoh and the personal features of a particular individual 
in the representation of his queen. Um, Menkora and his queen stride forward with their with their left feet. This is entirely expected for the king as males in Egyptian culture, as they almost always do so. But it is unusual for the females since they are generally depicted with their feet together. So that's another reason why I think um, historians were really um, interested in this statue, because she is her feet are kind of protruding, not as much as Menkora, but they definitely one foot is definitely in front of the other. They they both look beyond the present and and into this sort of timeless eternity. Their otherworldly visage um, display no human emotion whatsoever. So often we see a very calm, um, sort of stoic expression on Egyptian old kingdom Egyptian statues. And again, it's this idea of, of timelessness, eternity. And again, that really feeds into this idea of Egyptian, this idea of permanence. So the dyad was never finished. The area around the lower legs has not received a final polish and there is no inscription. However, despite this incomplete um, state, the image was erected in the temple and was brightly painted. There are traces of red around the king's ears and mouth and yellow on the queen's face. So that's something to think about too. Often these, um, we're so used to seeing these statues in their natural stone and they look very classical, but some, you know, often they were painted and often painted in these very bright colors. Um, you know, they did so, they did a lot of the relief carvings that way in Mesopotamia. Um, Egyptian statues were often painted and we also will see this with Greek and Roman statues as well. The presence of paint atop the smooth, dark, gray stone on a statue of the deceased king that was originally erected in his memorial temple courtyard, and that would have been outside, brings an interesting suggestion that perhaps the paint may have been intended to wear away through exposure and over time reveal the immortal black fleshed um, um, Menkora, so his divine spirit. Um, and so that's an interesting idea. Um, unusual for the Pharaoh's image, the king has no protective cobra, um, which often you see incorporated into the headdress. So that's something that he lacked. Um, this notable absence has led to the suggestion that both the king's nemesis and the queen's wig were originally covered in precious metal and um, the cobra would have been part of that addition. So they're thinking that maybe um, the addition of precious metals would have um, formed that snake. Based on comparison with other images, there is no doubt that this sculpture shows Minkora, but the identity of the queen is a different matter. She is clearly a royal female. She stands at nearly equal height with the king, and of the two of them, she is the one who is entirely frontal. In fact, it may be that um, the dyad is focused on the queen as its central figure rather than Menkora, on the prominence of the royal female at equal height and being portrayed frontally. In addition to the protective gesture she extends has suggested that rather than one of Menkora's wives, this is actually his queen mother. The function of the sculpture in any case was to ensure rebirth for the king in the afterlife. And so you do see that um, she really has a sort of protective um, embrace of the king. So we're going to look at a different type of statue. So what we've just looked at are the way royal um, figures are portrayed. So we're going to look at how other figures that non-royals are portrayed. So this is known as the seated scribe. It's a pretty famous statue, Egyptian statue. Um, the sculpture is known as the Seated Scribe. Um, it's one of the most famous unknown figures in the, mu in the Louvre Museum in Paris, France. What we do know is that the Seated Scribe derived somewhere from 2620 to 2500 BCE. Um, this, and this is circa the fourth dynasty of the Old Kingdom. Um, it was found in Saqqara, Egypt, and it is currently being held on display in the Louvre. So if we look at it, one of the things that you might notice is this very specific posture. Um, known as the seated scribe, it is indeed sitting cross-legged, his right leg crossed in front of his left. The white kilt stretched over his knees serves as a support. 
He is holding a partially rolled papyrus scroll in his left hand. His right hand must have held a brush or some sort of writing instrument that's now missing. The most striking aspect of the sculpture is the face, um, particularly the elaborate inlaid eyes. So these are inlaid with um, shell or, or stone. Um, they consisted of a that consisted of a piece of red veined um, white um, magnesium or magnesite. So so again, they were meant to look very realistic, in which a piece of slightly truncated rock crystal was placed. The front part of the crystal was carefully polished. The the back side was covered with a layer of organic material, creating the color of the iris and also probably serving as an adhesive. The entire eye was then held in the socket by two large copper clips welded on the back. A line of black paint defines the eyebrows. Um, the hands, fingers, and fingernails are sculptured or sculpted with remarkable delicacy. Um, his chest is broad and the nipples are marked by two wooden dowels. Um, generally speaking, when it comes to Old Kingdom art, there are basic patterns typically followed. Writing scribes were sculpted mainly during the 4th and 5th dynasty of the Old Kingdom. Pink or yellow stones, such as the color used for the scribe, denoted royalty um, and is made of a hard crystallized limestone. Limestone was a very abundant material in ancient Egypt. In ancient Egypt, the tint of the skin tone represents gender. In this case, the seated scribe has a red tint, meaning that the scribe was male. Something we'll see um, with ancient, um, we'll, we'll see it with um, early Greek art. Often, you know, men were depicted darker and women were depicted lighter to denote gender. The details painted on the figure include black paint for hair, eyebrows, eyelids, cosmetic lines, and nostrils, pink or red for fingernails and corners of eyes, white or yellow for garment. Material limestone was quite popular among Egyptian art. It was easy to retrieve, soft and porous, making it easier to prove to move around. Limestone was used mainly for tomb statuary. So again, this would have been found in a tomb. Um, another benefit to limestone is that it's, it is a neutral in color and this allowed for it to be completely painted um, as is this sculpture. We can definitely see that it was painted. Oops, I'm missing a picture. Okay, here we go. The seated scribe um, sculpture was discovered um, in Saqqara, Egypt on the 19th of November, 1850. According to the Louvre Museum, the semicircular base, let me go back to that original picture, um, and it's hard to see, but it's, here's, it's a semicircle, so it's actually rounded as we go towards the back um, of the figure. Um, where the figure sits must have originally fit into a larger base that carried um, the, his name and title. The base is missing and the context of this, the discovery does not provide any additional information. According to the archeologist, um, Auguste Margaret, um, Mar Marguerite um, found the work, who found the work, the excavation journals had been lost and the archives were scattered between France and Egypt. Furthermore, the site had been pillaged and ransacked and no further information concerning the figure's identity could be provided. Some historians have tried to link it to one of the owners of the statue discovered at the time. Um, the most convincing of these is associated with the scribe um, um, Hunifer. Um, so again, there's some question as to the identity of this figure. So this is the statue of um, Hernifer right here below. Um, and that dates from the fourth dynasty. This is an additional argument in favor of the earlier dating of, of the statue, the scribe, which has um, sometimes been dated into the sixth dynasty. Um, and so that's something we'll see that, you know, a lot of this information continues to change, that they're constantly doing research and, so often, um, you know, as new information comes in and um, it changes. Another argument supports this um, date is that the writing 
scribes, which that's what they were known as, were mostly created in the 4th and early 5th dynasties. After this period, most scribes were portrayed um, in reading poses. So, um, what we see here is uh, a scribe portrayed at work, which is unusual in Egyptian statuary. Um, you know, definitely with kings, we don't see them working. Um, we either see them standing very erect or and striding forward, or if they are seated, they're seated on a throne. And again, there's that sort of um, static and sort of rigidness that we, um, we saw with the earlier statue of Khafre. Although no king was ever portrayed in this pose, it seems that it was originally used for members of the royal family. So this isn't a king that's being depicted, but it possibly could be a, you know, someone important, but not, um, but a, maybe someone associated with the royal family, such as the king's son or grandsons. Um, and this is the case here. This is another statue um, that's made out of granite, um, and and this was the sons of. Um, Dadufri, and he was a fourth dynasty ruler, um, and they were represented in this position. Um, so some things that are different, though, and I'm going to do a compare and contrast is that, you know, again, this kind of, you know, this is definitely a much more informal and naturalistic depiction of the seated scribe. Um, and, you know, compared you know, another argument sort of for that this is definitely not a royal person, but maybe someone associated with the royal family is um, the the sort of lack of muscle. Here we have this idealized torso and he looks, you know, has broad shoulders and, um, you know, is, is lean. Here, you know, we see that he's a little flabby, you know, and there is a sense of age being indicated here as well. Um, here, he's idealized youthful, but I think when we look at this figure, it does look like a middle-aged um, person. So, you know, there is some arguments that this is actually a, a depiction of a scribe who, you know, that was an important position um, at, at the royal court. Um, and so, again, it's, he's not a, what I would consider an everyday person or a laborer, but he definitely is is not royalty or he's not or just associated with the royal family so he's depicted more naturalistically and so that's something that we're going to see that usually royalty was depicted in a very certain you know with certain conventions that we talked about earlier very stiff very erect usually the statues were made out of really hard stone um, the pharaoh was depicted with um, the beard the false beard the kilt um, and you know, people, um, everyday people were depicted more um, natural and, and, and not idealized and not youthful. So we'll, we'll get into this a little bit more when we look at um, some two-dimensional art. So in our next segments, we're going to be looking at architecture, um, the Great Pyramids, and we'll be looking at um, some two-dimensional painting um, and relief carving. So stay tuned.